Why don't we get started? I'm Frank Davis with the Friends School. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Chris Holden, um, who first faculty talk today. And you've got the title in front of you. As you probably know, but I'll just remind you, Chris is an environmental microbiologist, which means she studies tiny little things that make a huge difference in the environment. And she's worked in several different dimensions of environmental microbiology, both very fundamental biological work and a lot of applications to uh, environmental problem solving, including microbial dynamics in the Vedo zone of the soil and how b microbial assemblages respond to wetting and drying. Uh, she's done work in coastal, the pollution of coastal beaches and sources of that pollution, uh, bait and transport kinds of studies. Uh, recently, she's really put a lot of attention and effort into the environmental implications of nanotechnology, uh, very much of an emerging area of very great importance environmentally. And I guess your talk today is going to be heading in that direction with us. Um, very influential work in a lot of different arenas. So it's really a pleasure to have her here in the Bren School where she helps run, kind of co-anchors our Center of Excellence in Pollution, Bait, and Transport. Uh, if you don't know her pedigree, she arrived in the Bren School in 97. So she's been with us now for 12 years. And before that, she did master, PhD, and postdoc work at UC Berkeley. Before that, before coming to the left coast, she was at Purdue for a master's, an MS degree, and then at University of Knoxville for a bachelor's of science degree. So she's had quite a career already. And without cutting into her time anymore, it's just a real pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Tell us about interactions between Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Selenium quantum dots. Thank wow. you, Frank. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's a that's a really generous introduction. I greatly appreciate that, Frank. Um, well, thank you for coming. And uh, if you were brave enough to come with this kind of uh, convoluted title, kudos to you. But I'm going to start from a little uh, different point of uh, breadth, going back in time, maybe a time when some of us kind of listened to this music and back in the 70s and heard that, well, you know, we were living in the material world. Maybe that's when that first time that phrase became part of our popular culture. And then, again, maybe a little bit more recently, we got to hear it again in a slightly different context. We're in the material world. And in fact, um, we do live with a lot of material objects in the material world. Our lives are very much touched by what we buy what we surround ourselves with, and it certainly isn't just here in the United States. It's all over the world. We live in a material world afforded by a lot of advanced chemistry that's been developed over the course of decades during the Industrial Revolution, uh, tremendous advances in synthetic chemistry, organic, inorganic, so much so that we have this enormous list of chemicals that are on the Costa inventory. Not all of them are produced in great quantities. Many of them are produced in small quantities. But of those that are produced at greater than 10,000 pounds per year, there's actually very few that we know much about with regards to their influence, toxicologically speaking, on humans or the environment. Uh, it would be nice to know more about what we've surrounded ourselves with in this uh, material world. Um, there are some efforts, I bring this up early in the talk, uh, for those of you who are interested in, in how do we bridge this gap? What are we doing? What is society doing to bridge the gap between what's made versus what we know about what's made and what we surround ourselves with in this material world? Uh, there are efforts in high throughput screening terminology um, lifted from the pharmaceutical industry being used now to screen, perform assays, toxicological assays on chemicals for which we have little information, uh, mostly managed through COXCAS and EPA. And there's a lot of hope that through being able to perform thousands and thousands of assays per day, we can take mostly cellularly relevant information and translate that through a, an, an interpretation that will be relevant to understanding how chemicals interact with us and how they interact with the environment uh, to better our ability to perform risk analysis. And then we enter into kind of a whole new era, an era of 
of, of the ability to now scientists, not me, not people in my lab, but people that we collaborate with for sure, can manipulate atom by atom substances to do things like write a logo. So if you, you know, this is very interesting um, documentation of this logo on the IBM website where in 1989 an IBM researcher wrote with xenon atoms the logo for IBM. And so it was heralded as the first demonstration of real nanotechnology, even though the idea had been out for uh, quite some time. And so then we have this sort of new revolution in society in nanotechnology, understanding and control of matter between one and 100 nanometers. So it's not just making solutions or uh, synthesizing uh, solvents uh, in the laboratory or purifying, distilling solvents, but it's actually constructing materials atom by atom. That's the idea. And uh, these materials are inherently small, um, and it involves imaging, measuring, modeling, uh, manipulation. I refer you to, if you are new to this subject, the NNI website, the National Nanotechnology Initiative. The federal government is investing a lot in trying to further nanotechnology as a, a research area and as an economic growth area in the United States. And this is documented uh, currently and on an ongoing way in the, in the NNI uh, website. There's a lot of information there. Stepping back for a minute, because this is such a nascent area, nanotechnology, nanotechnology in the environment, nanotechnology in human health, how it's changing our material world. It's such a nascent area that we still have to remind ourselves, what are we talking about? So we're not just talking about things that are small. There are a lot of things that are small that exist in nature that are the essence of life. A lot of you know, biomacromolecules that we know well, mineral structures that we know well. These are things that are at that scale of a billionth of a meter, and we know them well, they exist in nature, they're part of our natural world. Nanotechnology is about things at that scale that don't exist in the natural world that can be built atom by atom, that may be built to be interactive, that may be built to be machinery, and some of that is rather futuristic, but that's part of the vision. More about sort of differentiating between nanotechnology and nanoscale. This type of material, this is titanium dioxide, used in paints, used in sunscreen, made industrially for decades and in our society, in our material world for decades. This material is, a lot of it is manufactured to be nanoparticulate. And when you purchase it, it may be highly agglomerated structures of nanoparticles, the primary particles that are at the nanoscale. And it's been used for decades in coating. It's been used for decades in sunscreen. But yet there are still lots of questions about this material. It's not nanotechnology. These are nanomaterials. These are nanoparticles. These are particles that have nanoscale features that high have high surface area to volume ratio ratios, but they're not nanotechnology. These are nanoparticles. Still there are many, many questions about how do these particulate substances interact with humans? How do they interact with the environment? How do we respond to them as part of our material world when we're being exposed to them consistently, chronically, through, uh, through um, the coatings that we're exposed to, through sunscreens, and through emerging ideas and using them as disinfectants in water treatment, for example. So a lot of the slides that I have in here, and, and I think these are going to be posted somewhere so you can take advantage of some of the websites in case you're interested. This is a recent case study project that the EPA conducted. And uh, within this case study, if you're interested in this subject, you can see that uh, there are questions regarding state and transport, regarding purity of the material, regarding life cycle analysis, regarding uh, human health, regarding ecological responses. Uh, despite the fact that this material has been with us and in use part of our material world for a decade. Not a nanotechnology, but a nanoparticle and sometimes clustered within this overall concern of nanomaterials in the environment. One of the big interests is life cycle analysis. Um, and if you look at the date of this publication, this is really one of the only, one of the few life cycle analysis studies on 
a currently existing uh, nanomaterial saying that like CIO2 ends up, depending on how it's used in this particular society system, in cool treatment plants, waste incineration, and then ultimately in, in the landfill. Okay, so, so nanotechnology, existing nanomaterials in society, nanomaterials that are being developed for particular interactions with organisms as disinfectants. Here's an example of the production of a nanomaterial, a nanoparticle, purposefully to act as a disinfectant, to act, to act as an antimicrobial. These are silver nanoparticles, pure silver, uh, based on their shape, whether they're rods, whether they're pyramids, or whether they're spherical, they have entirely different toxicological profiles to bacteria. Okay? So they're about the same size, but their shape has a profound effect on how they interact with cells. Uh, they're used. They're used in clothing. So you can buy socks that are impregnated with nano silver to make them more antimicrobial. It's shown, there are studies that show that when you wash these socks and you wash other clo clothing, they release the silver. It definitely gets discharged into the sanitary sewage system, goes into the wastewater. Whether or not it gets removed in wastewater treatment is something that's under study. But this is an example of really nanotechnology in the sense that these particles are being produced at different sizes, different shapes to improve their efficacy towards, uh, towards uh, killing bacteria, towards being my antimicrobial. So CiO2, been around for a long time, nano silver uh, becoming a part of our material world increasingly in clothing, in appliances, in a lot of different products. If you would like to know more about the plethora of different projects and how that front is emerging, turn to the nanotechnology project, the project on emerging nanotechnology, where you can look on the web, uh, the current state of affairs, and keep up with it over time, the consumer products that incorporate nanomaterials. So there's something over, a, like over 800 at this point that include uh, manufactured identified nanomaterials or nanotechnology. If the manufacturers aren't identifying, if they're not self-identifying, then we don't know about it. Uh, this is also a repository for other information, where manufacturers are located, how this is showing up in food, and roles in medicine. And so part of what you find out by tracking this inventory over time is that the total number of products on a list of like this inventory is growing. This is over the period of 2006 to 2008. More indication that this new type of chemistry, new types of materials are entering our material world because they're showing up in consumer products, they're being self-identified in consumer products. And in fact, um, you know, the, 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 the pace is about a doubling every 12 to 18 uh, months, such that you know, within about a decade, we would have probably close to 100,000 products that contain nanomaterials, nanotechnology. This is above and beyond the materials that have been in our society for a long time. So at the same time that this, when NNI is investing aggressively in the pursuit of nanotechnology research, nanotechnology innovations that are beneficial in medicine and energy, uh, beneficial generally to society, we have a growing concern that tiny particles contain huge promise, but we don't really know how safe they are. Sort of sounds familiar compared to uh, our, our inspection of the Costco list and our understanding of how much tox toxicological information is present on currently available and too few people are trying to find out. So let's look at the pace of knowledge. You can do this really easily, and I did this a couple of years ago, so it's probably just a little bit out of date. Look at, just simply go to the Web of Science and search on citations that include nanopart, nanomat, nanotechnology. So this would capture peer-reviewed papers that include either in the subject or in the title those phrases. And you know, perhaps an indication of the pace of general knowledge that's mostly in technological advancement, new chemistries, new technologies uh, that are showcasing new nanomaterials and their properties. And that's indicated by the black line. 
in an eye coming uh, in, in fourth uh, seemed to be you know, helping to uh, increase the pace of knowledge generation, knowledge publication. On the other hand, when we look at the phrase, phrases uh, including nano, environment, pop, health, safety, occupational, nanotoxicology, the knowledge, the published knowledge has seriously not. Okay? So that's why there's an interest, a growing interest in research in this area. But it's a difficult area to enter into. Um, the first thing that, that one gets to grasp is how infinite the number of potential chemistries are and how potentially what you're working with can change simply by the solution, the aqueous medium in which you're studying, or the biotic environment in which the nanoparticle is released. So, you know, this picture shows sort of an idealized conceptual uh, representation of a nanoparticle with a certain core chemistry. Wouldn't necessarily be spherical. A certain coating chemistry, a size and shape, uh, charge characteristics that are associated with the coating chemistry. Uh, the coating chemistry affecting the reactivity, but also depending on atmospheric conditions, solution chemistry conditions, um, the surface area varying with size and shape. These are all the different variables that can influence how a nanoparticle interacts with organisms and ultimately uh, the environment. So taking that into context, what is nanotechnology? It's a revolution in our material world. We're increasingly seeing consumer products incorporating nanomaterials. Let's turn to a specific case with which uh, my research group has been involved in a few years. And I'm using today as this example a published study. It's a study that was published in Environmental Science and Technology earlier this year. It has to do with cadmium selenide quantum dots. And some of you in this room have quite a bit of experience with cadmium selenide quantum dots. Um, they are nanoparticles that are synthesized. So this truly is nanotechnology. They're synthesized to specific sizes because the size determines the fluorescence characteristics, the light emission characteristics. So um, what, what, what this relates to is that you know, some, nan some quantum dots are fluorescent uh, orange and some of them are fluores fluorescent blue and some green, some yellow, et cetera. You can stop the synthesis at a specific size and know that you will achieve a particular fluorescence spectra for that particle. Really valuable when you want to use it in uh, a clinical application or in cell labeling and research because you can take green, yellow, or red fluorescing quantum dots that are, again, the synthesis is stopped so that they're a specific size and you can multiply label cells, different cells or different tissues in the same sample just based on applying these different quantum dots, as long as they have an affinity for the receptors that you're trying to target. So they are potentially very powerful. We're interested in less in labeling and more interested in the environment. What happens to these types of materials when they are potentially released? And as they're used, increasingly, they will inevitably be released into coastal environments, into terrestrial environments. What happens? Well, looking close enough into any of these environments, we have bacteria. They're everywhere. They're on the surfaces of sand grains and estuaries, and they're on uh, soil particles. They're part of the fabric of soil and, and part of the soil genesis. And they're doing all the things that you need in, in terrestrial and estuarine ecosystems in terms of nitrogen cycling, carbon cycling, sulfur, ion cycling, et cetera. So it matters to us in a sense for, for sort of a couple of reasons how nanotechnologies, new chemistries are influencing organisms in these environments, bacteria in these environments, because it could alter biogeochemical cycling. At the same time, organisms at these scales can alter the trajectory of nanomaterials, alter their course towards drinking water supply. Bacteria are uh, are, are, are coexisting already with minerals at the nanoscale. This is uh, fairly well understood, but also an area of research. 
um, bacteria, these are individual bacterial cells in each one of these frames, and uh, they particularly well capture that bacteria reside inside a polymeric matrix, which are the void space around the cell. And then they're armored with nanoscale minerals that exist in nature. Okay? So when we're thinking about new, new types of particles entering their world, changing what they do, and these organisms changing the fate of engineered nanomaterials that are released from the environment, just as they change the fate of petroleum hydrocarbons, just as they change the fate of chlorinated solvents. We, 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 we keep in mind this physical, local structuring, that there are naturally occurring nanoscale minerals. These are part of the organism uh, microstructure, and um, it must shape in some way the response to foreign nanoscale minerals. So the quantum dots that um, we are working with in this study. So if you wanted to buy quantum dots, you can go to chemical supply catalogs and you can purchase them. You can purchase them from a number of different companies with a number of different chemistries. Some of them are coated with zinc sulfide. They're all different sizes. Some arrive in solvents but it's difficult to remove the solvent, the organic solvent, uh, when you want to um, uh, work with them in aqueous conditions. We decided we didn't want to work with industrial nanomaterials for these studies. We wanted to synthesize our own uh, cadmium selenide quantum dot. And so we worked with the collaborators. Another hallmark of this type of research, it's very collaboration intensive. Uh, we're not the material scientists. It's upon us to uh, beg the expertise of material scientists to understand more about the nanomaterials that we're working with and, and, and typically to acquire them. The quantum dots that we've been studying in this particular uh, report that I'm sharing with you today are a worksite structure, the worksite crystal structure with five nanometers in size. Uh, they're synthesized according to uh, this method of road dash that I. And we entered into this particular study that I'm sharing with you with these particular questions. How do cadmium selenide quantum dots, as one type, one very narrow type of engineered nano material, affect bacterial growth? So a simple physiological study. Because when bacteria grow, they catalyze reactions. Okay? And it's ultimately the reactions that they catalyze that we're concerned with. And then what are the fates of cadmium selenide quantum dots with bacteria? How does what bacteria do to those quantum dots potentially change their bioavailability to other receptors, to higher organisms, or their course uh, in the environment as they might migrate through the drinking water supply? So we have in mind, and this is sort of the thread that runs through a lot of our research, the interactive effect between nanoparticles and bacteria. How does nanoparticles change bacteria? How do bacteria alter nanoparticles? Um, the paper that I'm describing to you today was published uh, earlier this year. Uh, the researchers primarily were John Schuster, postgraduate researcher uh, in the Brin School for a number of years. He performed almost all of the biological experimentation and all the analytical chemistry that I'm describing today and all the biomarkers effects work that I just talked about. So he was the primary researcher in this uh, study. Peter Schleimanoff, uh, material scientist, postdoc in, the Dale, in Dale and Stuckey's lab, synthesized the cadmium selenide quantum dots. So we always had a very reliable stock of nanomaterials, reliably synthesized, reliable characteristics to work with because of Peter's expert hands in synthesizing uh, the materials that we needed. Randall Milkey, who's in the audience today, absolute expert in electron microscopy. It was essential uh, for this study to be able to visualize the ultimate location of the nanomaterials, and you'll see that in the results, because knowing where they are as an endpoint is, is, is essential to try to describe the origin of the toxic effects that we're seeing. How are they actually manifested? Sam Webb at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory. He brought to us the capability of using the selenium oxidation state as a tracer for the intactness of these uh, quantum dots. Cadmium is in the plus two oxidation state. 
with uh, selenide in the minus two oxidation state, if the cadmium selenide starts to dissolve, the selenide is subject to oxidation. So in the minus two state, it can be readily oxidized to the zero oxidation state and, and change further. So having SANS uh, collaboration was essential for us to be able to, to use uh, canadium as a, as a tracer in this oxidation state. Chris Earhart, earth scientist, uh, graduate student at the time, performed XRG, X-ray diffraction, to track the crystal structure of the nanoparticles, seeing if we still had a worst site signal in this sample. Uh, Jingjing Zhang, a microscopist materials research lab, Galen Schmucky, professor of inorganic chemistry, material uh, chemistry, and biochemistry here at UCSD. So it's not a small method. A lot of environmental research takes collaboration, uh, takes productive collaboration, but this is really, as I uh, am, am discovering, a particular area where interdisciplinarity is absolutely necessary in crossing boundaries that we may not have been crossing in the past. Um, this was our hypothetical framework. When we started this project, we were overwhelmed with the various degrees of freedom. You present a cadmium selenide quantum dot to a bacteria, what could be the potential outcome? And there was not a lot of information. My collaborator, Jay Nadeau, who's the first author in this uh, book chapter listed here in which this uh, conceptual diagram is published, um, she was the first to publish with uh, Randy as a co-author, Randy Milker as a co-author. She was the first to publish a study showing that cadmium selenide quantum dots could stain bacteria and, in fact, could, under some conditions, enter cells. Okay? So they're too big. They're five nanometers. This is a bacterial cell in gray here, a representation of a cell with its uh, softer gray uh, matrix around it, polymeric matrix. The membrane, that is the double line on the outside of this dark gray cell, has pore sizes that are a, mic a, a nanometer or less. The, the, the pore sizes are too small to allow free, free passage of uh, a cadmium selenide quantum dot. Okay? Uh, so the cadmium selenide quantum dot initially presented to the cell on the outside, and it will reach bacteria if it's released into the environment because bacteria are everywhere, could initially break down in the environment surrounding the bacteria. That is, it could dissolve, it could lose its little cap, substrate in this case. It could dissolve under various environmental conditions into its constituent elements, cadmium and uh, selenium, cadmium and selenide. Those ions can freely pass into the cell. If they do, they can accumulate. In the case of selenide, it could oxidize. And when it does, it forms a solid, uh, the red color, red precipitate. They may stay in the cell, those selenium crystals that form if this happens, or they could be expelled. The cells have the capacity to do that. On the other hand, if the ions enter the cell, they could reform into quantum dots. Bacteria are known to synthesize nanocrystals. This has been observed in nature. It's been observed in the laboratory. They could be expelled. So these are like the, the variety of different, if you will, microscale state and transport processes that were hypothesized. In order to enter the cell as a whole quantum dot, the membrane would have to be damaged. Uh, on the other hand, the quantum dot could simply bind to the outside of the cell, stain it, and if the quantum dots get highly fl fluorescent, then the cell would, by virtue of that, appear very fluorescent, and then you have a nicely stained uh, bacteria. Knowing that selenium goes, uh, is, is uh, subject to changing its oxidation state, we made use of that, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, and used the oxidation state of selenium as a tracer for the impact mass. Our approaches in this study, the study was wholly performed in the laboratory, and to answer those specific questions, showing Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a widely distributed gram-negative bacteria, very metabolically versatile, rapidly growing, uh, very resistant to heavy metal toxicity, very resistant to a lot of insults, including antibiotics. Um, and what we asked was, uh, you know, when we grow Pseudomonas aeruginosa, how are the effects of selenium versus cadmium ions versus cadmium selenide quantum dots, how do they differ from one another? And can we 
quantify the differences and explain the differences. Uh, we also wanted to know where the materials ended up in the cell, in what shape they were in. Did they break down? Did they accumulate in particular regions? And we had to use, as I described a few minutes ago, a whole host of different technologies, and that's part of why this becomes a very interdisciplinary type of effort. We're using um, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, ICPMS, to quantify total metal within the biomass that's accumulated. Total could include resolved and nanoparticulates, and so in order to assess the difference and, in effect, quantify the nanoparticulate by the difference, we have another methodology for quantifying resolved fragments. Um, as I mentioned before, electron microscopy was essential to visualize where does this material end up in a cell? Uh, and, and to be able to relate its final destination to the endpoint effects that we measure to infer possible mechanisms for effects. And then tracking this uranium oxidation state with X-ray absorption near edge spectra, a technology that doesn't exist here, but it's at a collaborator's institution, the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory. And it takes an expert in that area to run the instrument. Expecting that from the literature, what we know a lot uh, about is that, is that um, and there's been a, a number of studies suggesting that reactive oxygen states are free, uh, free radicals. And we talk about free radicals in our own body. We're concerned about excessive free radical uh, formation and how this causes cellular damage, DNA damage, causes mutations, can lead to higher incidence of cancer. Well, generically, any oxidative metabolism produces ample free radicals of oxygen superoxide, hydroxyl radical, uh, hydrogen peroxide. There's a lot of evidence, abundant evidence, to suggest that various nanoparticles can enhance the concentration of RAF inside cells. And so this is something that we wanted to test. And then our endpoint was to relate the effects, distribution, and ROS measurements. So we dissected this and said, okay, we're going to do it piece by piece. If the quantum dots are dissolving, which they might, then there might be an effect of the selenium by itself. So let's test that first. Okay? So this is a simple optical density. Okay, so it's just a proxy for biomass. It's not counting cells. It's not quantifying DNA. I'm not showing you all the data that we collected, but I'm giving you uh, evidence for the results and our interpretation. So this is a proxy for biomass. Biomass is increasing toward the control, the dotted line here, at an exponential rate in rich media in which we perform these studies. So growth over time, the population size is increasing. In the presence of selenium in the plus four oxidation state, not in the minus two, because in the minus two oxidation state, you can't work with it. It's a volatile compound, and it readily oxidizes anyway. And in the environment, selenide will readily oxidize to elements of selenium to selenize into selenium. So our best proxy for assessing the effects of selenium was to deliver to the cells sodium selenite. And what we found is um, there, there was a, an appearance of enhanced growth, but it really wasn't enhanced growth. It was really the appearance of no effect because the cells uh, accumulated selenite uh, and uh, reduced it to elemental selenium. And that's why the, the pulse here appears red, because elemental selenium precipitates at very red. Okay. Um, and then, you know, interestingly, so this is just a little aside about what bacteria can do. They can assemble uh, anions and cations into, uh, you know, modulate the oxidation state. In this case, the elemental selenium, when it's formed, uh, forms in very regular particle sizes on the order of nine nanometers in size. So now we have this sort of solar system of nine nanometer selenium particles inside the cell simply by filling them, feeding them in cell selenite. Okay. So our interpretation is it's not toxic. Selenium is probably not the origin of toxicity. If we find toxicity in the cells, it's both the cadmium and selenide quantum dots. Cadmium is a known toxicant. It's a heavy metal. It's uh, not a necessary nutrient for any organism although there is some evidence that it uh, is prevalent in certain diatoms, which may imply its role in diatom physiology. But for the most part, it's a toxicant. Um, 
when we expose these bacteria to cadmium at in a salt form, fully dissolved at different concentrations, we saw a typical dose-response relationship. And there are other publications in the literature about cadmium and its influences on growth rates, growth rates and growth extents in different strains of Pseudomonia, different species and different strains. And so the population increase with time through exponential phase and then the stationary phase and the relationship of those increases, those trajectories with an increasing concentration of cadmium, these were expected dose-response relationships that we saw. And we also uh, noted that um, exponential phase, that is the onset of rapid growth, was happening around uh, six hours or so. And this is important as we started to consider the differences between cells being exposed to cadmium versus cadmium cyanide quantum for meth uh, treatment. So here we looked at, and this is all the work of John Feaster, the first author on this paper. He worked very diligently for a, a period of time, a number of years, performing these different growth curve studies, first in one type of apparatus, then in another type of apparatus, and had a high a degree of replication and to characterize using other biochemical assays. And I'm showing you the optical density measurements here. An interesting but somewhat different type of dose-response relationship. We have uh, collaborators in the room here who are trying to model this uh, data. And it's that type of effort feeding back to us is extremely informative, very exciting, because it causes us to look at our data in a slightly different way. But the impression is that there is a dose-response relationship with rapid growth still occurring according to John's analysis, uh, still the onset being around six hours. Rapid growth and, um, for the most part, growth rate, which is relatively speaking the slope through these, this region, exponential phase to the different treatments, um, uh, an indication of toxicity. Okay, so looking at this data, one might say, well, the curves sort of qualitatively resemble the cadmium data. Maybe the quantum meth is just dissolving. That's what happens with nano silver. There's a lot of publications, okay? And, and, and the reason that I chose this study to share with you today is because this is one of the big concerns about the way, it, it demonstrates one of the large concerns about the way this type of research is done. It's absolutely essential to think about what are the proper controls, what are you trying to measure? And if what you're measuring in the end is only the effect of the ion that's released during dissolution, is that particularly interesting or is that particular to a nanomaterial? So we studied the dissolution. John studied the dissolution. And what he learned was that the quantum dots did dissolve. He performed a, a series of studies to look at uh, how much, how many, what, what concentration of cadmium ions are released in, into aqueous media, the aqueous media that's used for the growth experiments, how much is released, and how do we model this type of data? So uh, there is a dissolution process that occurs. It occurs over a period of time, and it, it does appear that this reaches sort of a saturation concentration. But the quantum dots aren't completely dissolving, and they're certainly not completely dissolving by the time rapid growth begins in these experiments. Okay? In fact, they only dissolve to about 50% over a much longer time frame under the conditions of our experiments. So this would suggest that qualitatively, the dose-response relationships that we're seeing for cadmium versus quantum dots can't be fully explained. The, the, the comparability of those relationships can't be fully explained by dissolution. And we can't assi assign necessarily fully toxicity to cadmium ions that are liberated during dissolution of the polymer. Okay, so um, what we did then is we looked at the overall growth data in a different, in sort of a different way. We said at six hours when exponential phase is occurring, if we relate the growth rate to dissolved cadmium concentrations at that starting point of rapid growth, so at six hours, how much dissolved cadmium is present in the cadmium ion treatments? How much dissolved cadmium is present in the quantum dot treatments where cells are fed only quantum dots, but there has been some dissolution in the first six hours preceding rapid growth? When we compare the growth rate and all of those growth curves that I showed you, that is the 
the, the specific growth rate constant for exponential phase two cadmium ion concentration at the onset of rapid growth, we see that there's an overlap between the treatment for cadmium acetate, the cadmium ion treatment, and the cadmium cyanide quantum dot treatment at low concentrations. And then we reach this, what we call the threshold in the paper. This was our interpretation. So there is some concentration threshold here at which the two relationships, that is growth rate versus dissolved cadmium concentration in an experimental setup with only dissolved cadmium at the beginning or an experimental setup with only quantum dot at the beginning. There is a departure at some concentration of dissolved cadmium that's occurring at certain times. We called this the threshold, beyond which apparently there's an extension of this negative, steep negative trajectory in growth declination due to the nanoparticles, the residual cadmium cyanide quantum dots that are in the media. Cells, on the other hand, that are only exposed to cadmium, and we know that Pseudomonas aeruginosa has very robust resistance mechanisms. It takes in cadmium ions uh, uh, passively. It uses efflux pumps like it does with antibiotics and solvents to pump them out. It only has a certain amount of capacity to do that. At, at a certain point where so much cadmium ion has built up in the cell, it starts to overwhelm the pumps and they back up and then you start to see accumulation and just plain draining. But the, the point here is that this was, this was a pivotal interpretation by us of these findings that we have a threshold effect beyond which nanoparticles are more influential on growth than are cadmium ions. And so what's going on? It's not a simply, uh, we can't simply assign the effect to just one thing. Now let's step back and look at a couple of other studies that I found particularly interesting as we were gathering this data. Uh, we weren't necessarily aware of these studies because they were in the mammalian cell culture literature. These were working with cancer cells uh, where they looked at cadmium telluride quantum dots, slightly different chemistry but similar idea, and found that they produced a lot of free radicals and that the free radicals um, damaged cancer cell membranes. And that allowed the quantum dots to flow into the cells. And then when they flowed into the cells, they wreaked all sorts of havoc. They damaged DNA. They interfered with my mitochondrial activity. Um, they were very reactive inside the cell. Uh, another study uh, showed that cadmium selenide quantum dots could be taken into mammalian cancer cells uh, through endocytosis, a normal defense mechanism, and that once they got in there, it was the amount of material that was endocytosed that really correlated with toxicity. So it was how much was in the cell that really uh, corresponded to uh, the negative effects on the cell. And that if you matched the, the quantum dot somehow with polyethylene glycol, you could decrease the amount of endo endocytosis decrease the amount that's taken up and therefore decrease the toxic effects. So going back to our hypothetical diagram, then we knew, okay, we see effects on growth. We see that there appears to be differential effects of the ions versus the nanoparticle beyond a threshold. Where is the material? It seems to matter from the other literature whether the quantum dots are in the cell or not, whether they're on the outside, whether they're broken down. And so, um, this is where electron microscopy having the ability to visualize the cells and gain an impression through visualization at high magnification was really in, uh, essential, really uh, uh, part of our uh, research. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, not exposed to cadmium or quantum dot um, with normal rod shape morphology, um, it, it, the membranes are intact. Um, the material in the cell appears um, normal. On the other hand, the bacteria grown with cadmium ions, one of our students at different concentrations, as I mentioned before, these bacteria have a really robust efflux pump resistance mechanism, and the pumps are located in the periplasmic space, so in between the uh, inter and outer membrane. And so the cadmium flows in as ions, cells are trying to pump it out, it backs up, 
they can't pump it out fast enough to start to form these little incursions of cadmium, uh, and that's what these little white specks are. So I think we're not unexpected, but interesting to see. On the other hand, um, a really important part of our interpretation of what was differentially uh, separating the, the, the two, these two treatments, the cadmium versus the quantum dots, is, is that the quantum dot treated cell beyond this threshold looked obliterated. And you know we didn't just take one image or two images. There were scores of images. There were many, many images that were acquired and then quantitatively analyzed. Uh, and so we knew the frequency of membrane damage in this treatment versus this treatment. Uh, we also could readily observe that the nanoparticles were not attached to the outside of the cell. If they were associated with the cell, they were inside. Uh, found quantitatively, analyzed these particles, assuming they might be quantum dots, found that they were on the order of about eight nanometers. It's close, it's not exact, it's not five nanometers, but they may have acquired lots of other things, and that's why they appear bigger. They weren't on the outside of the cell, they were clearly inside. With EDS, um, we could confirm that those regions in the cell were rich in cadmium and selenium, giving us the impression that the quantum dots were inside the cell. Then we start to use other technologies to ask, okay, are they intact or are cadmium and selenium just co-localized in the cell? So are the quantum dots intact? And the impression we get from this uh, technique, Zane, is that the organization of these two per the blue, which is our sample cells that have been exposed to cadmium cyanide quantum dots, and the black, which is the standard elemental selenium standard, the overlap on the vertical of those two peaks strongly suggested to our expert in Zane that most of the selenium inside the cell was in fact elemental. So we see evidence of quantum dots in the cell, and we see co-localization of selenium and cadmium, but the Zanes is telling us that a lot of it, a lot of the selenium is elemental selenium, and so the quantum dots are apparently highly broken down. Um, there's also evidence without a standard here, but our expert um, uh, felt that there was evidence for organo-selenium complexes. Still working at the limit of resolution of a lot of this technology. So throwing at this problem, the most sophisticated technology we could, we could, we could grab onto and finding that the scanning transmission electron microscopy suggests there's intact quantum dots. And we even with X-ray diffraction saw a little wartzite key consistent with the crystal structure of the original material. So, um, so then, you know, so then we look at so we're starting to pull together an interpretation. I'll come back and summarize that. And then we look at the reactivity of the material in whatever form it is inside the cell. And I'm pointing to this uh, one pair of data points that show a differential reactive oxygen species um, concentration per cell uh, relative to the total cadmium concentration. And the point here is that cells experiencing cells exposed to cadmium selenide quantum dots had a much higher concentration of these free radicals inside the cell. Okay. And this is above that threshold concentration, which may greatly influence the result that we found uh, of a nanoparticle type effect above and beyond the uh, cadmium cell. So then putting these pieces together, taking what was a hypothetical framework and putting it back into a summary of what we found, um, what we found is that the quantum dots, what we believe happened is that they destroyed cell membranes, potentially through the formation and transformation of RLS. How the RLS was formed, it's really difficult to say. Is it interaction of the quantum dots with the membrane, with the energized membrane? We don't know. There's some follow-up studies that are collaborative that are working on in that regard. Uh, we believe that quantum dots entered the cells intact and were highly reactive in, inside the cell, but a lot of them broke down into cadmium and into uh, elemental selenium. And then we had these measurements of, you know, sort of a mass balance of the material, a pretty tight mass balance, being able to assign these different compartments, the quantities of material that we delivered. And we saw that there was this, you know, almost 5,000-fold enrichment of cadmium when, when the cells were presented with dissolved cadmium. So it's like we had hyper-accumulated cadmium. 
Um, they also accumulated cadmium in the form of quantum dust, to the best of our ability to resolve it. And this brings us to the conclusions of this one study with one type of bacteria, one type of nanoparticle. Juxtapose that uh, across the entire spectrum of what I told you earlier about uh, how nascent this field is, how many questions there are. This is what we thought we learned. That the ions in this case, cadmium, could explain part but not all of the toxicity. There appeared to be a nanoparticle effect. There's not that many reports of a, quote, nanoparticle effect. And so uh, this is still a big question in cellular interactions with nanoparticles. Where does it arise? Is it something that's generalizable across a lot of different chemistries? Uh, what is going on? Um, the toxicity, greater than cadmium, uh, uh, beyond the threshold. The fact that the quantum dust didn't appear to absorb. And that the pseudomonas appeared to alter the state of the quantum dust. Um, extracellularly, in the presence of bacteria, the quantum dust were more stabilized than just in uh, abiotic conditions. We think there could be environmental implications. We are funded by the EPA. We have been for the most part to do this work. It's upon us to try and conceive of experiments that we think could give us insights into potential environmental interactions and to then think about potential environmental implications. Uh, one uh, environmental implication is potentially activation. If uh, cells are affording the breakdown, enhancing the breakdown of quantum dots, then they might be activating the nanoparticles and making them more potentially toxic by absorbing them. If they're hyperaccumulating cadmium, like we see here, then they're, they're akin. They're causing sequestration. On the other hand, if the cells move, then it's another mode of transfer for the material. So there's different ways to look at this, but it's upon us to think about the environmental implications. We have other research that's ongoing. So this was a baseline study. We learned a lot. We formed a lot of important collaborations. Uh, we got a lot of techniques going. But now we have this other study that's complete uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Arias uh, here, an expert in protozoology with his graduate student, Rebecca Worlin, of a manuscript in separation control and token transfer. Uh, Randy Murphy is also involved in that as well. Christian Menneker, a PhD student at MIT, who studied effects mechanisms, trying to understand what might really be different about uh, the ways that cells are responding to quantum dots versus cadmium. Randy Murphy is looking at biotoxicity and trying to use advanced technologies and imaging to try and understand how nanomaterials are changing inside a cell. And then we have a whole host of other people that are trying to tackle these other types of particles that have been in our material world for a long time, but we still have huge lack of information with regards to how they interact with bacteria. Alice Van Kirk has uh, completed a study in agglomerate stability, looking at how bacteria and plants do agglomeration and deagglomeration of antibiotics. Allison and postdoc uh, Rajiv Kanti are studying effects biomarkers uh, for these different metal oxides and bacteria. Raj has completed a study looking at multiple strains, so going beyond pseudomonas aeruginosa, so looking at gram-positive and other gram-negative bacteria and using environmentally relevant media. So something that's not so rich, nutrient rich and salty as the nitrocellular media we usually use in the preferred all study. And then Juan Zhe, very importantly taking these issues to the next level, the ecosystem level. How are biogeochemical processes actually affected? This next tier of research is being performed mostly within the context of the CEIN, a newly funded center in environmental implications of nanotechnology. The director is at UCLA, I'm Darnell. The co-directors here at Santa Barbara are Phil Keller and the Ben School. We have many, many, many collaborators. I see uh, faces in this room who are involved in the collaboration here at UCSD, other UCs, and worldwide. For the tune of $24 million, we hope that we can make a lot of advances in this center across a whole um, menu of different issues, be it uh, nanomaterial characteristics, mechanisms of cellular effects, ecosystem effects, um, uh, patent transport, and putting it all together in a, in a model and framework along with societal implications. So I want to acknowledge the funding sources. Um, I, I shared with you one study that took funding from the EPA and a lot of people involved to make that happen. Uh, the work that's ongoing is being funded by NSF and EPA. And then again, to reiterate the importance of all the partners, the researchers that actually 
have done the work, are doing the work, and then the intellectual collaborators, uh, the Rusecki, uh, Josh Kimmel, Ed O'Reilly, Terry Cherry, Jay Nadeau, and Bill University. And uh, I hope I've left some time for questions. Thank you. So I've been told if there's questions that DJ has a microphone and that she's asking a few questions. question about um, the, um, uh, the growth curve. I think the theory can accumulate different uh, amounts of these nanoparticles and they can scatter in these, these different uh, mass regions. Is that not disqualifying the optical density of proxy volume? Well, it could, particularly uh, when we have um, information higher up. So if we go back to So let's talk about that. What would actually happen if um, the cells were hyperaccumulating? Let's look at the cadmium, for example. Okay. So in this case, the cells are hyperaccumulating cadmium, and we have increasing concentrations of cadmium. And, and with higher and higher concentrations initially of cadmium, they're accumulating more and more cadmium. What would that? Wh how would that change these curves? How would these curves look different? This way. Well, but it's pertinent to this as well because we know that cadmium is accumulating in cells. So this is, it's, it's pertinent to this question. It is pertinent to this one as well because we actually do see evidence that we're over shooting the control. And it very well could be that what's happening there is similar to what's happening here. But is that also not because of the accumulation of the particles rather than uh, having really no bacteria in there. Well, it's hard to argue that completely when you're looking at these early time points and that's where exponential uh, uh, exponential growth rates are calculated. And if that were the case, then we would have really quite a different relationship between those curves early in exponential phase when those growth rates are calculated. So th I don't doubt that there's uh, accumulation you know, later at 24 hours uh, when we measured the amount of material in the cells. Uh, but early in exponential phase, it's, it's kind of hard necessarily to ar argue that. Yeah, we do have other, just one other to answer your question, because we do have other metrics for growth. So we measured DNA. Uh, we have actual cell counts in some treatments, not for all the treatments. Can you also explain that? And because I'm a bit suspicious of the low quantum dust concentration you get in the end in a higher yield than if it's not there. Yeah, the and, then and so, but, but that's c completely indicative of what we're seeing in the electron micrograph. And that doesn't make this wrong. It makes it, it, makes it confirmatory that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing accumulation in the cells in the electron micrographs. Those electron micrographs were performed on s samples that were taken at 24 hours. And so it's completely confirmatory with the idea of accumulation in the cell. So if anything, you are underestimating the effects. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if they were, if, if there was a, you know, these are things that we look for without a doubt. And, um, you know, for example, in, in other studies that have been performed in our lab where we've had a significant association of the metal particle, I'm speaking to your work, Allison, if you don't mind. Um, there's there, there was a necessity of performing the growth experiments with uh, completely independent metrics of biomass, and so looking at intracellular DNA or protein or cell counts because of the high affinity of the particles to the cells, and then the aberration on um, you know the the optical properties of the cell as well. So we you know we we are aware that that can be an issue. So, you know, these were these experiments were performed um, to assess the potential, and then we looked at sort of where is the material ending up, and um, and looked at the relationship between these curves, and it made sense to us. Hello. 
Um, when the cells do accumulate at cadmium ions or quantum dots, cadmium slash palladium, uh, quantum dots do, do they eventually die or do they recover? Um, have you looked at the death and survival of the cells? Yeah, I didn't show any of that data. Um, so, uh, so <laughs> that's interesting, and I think it would be really um, you have to be careful. I, one would have to be careful about how they assess that. So, one way to assess it that would be credible would then be to try and reculture. So, you know, using that material as inoculum, see if we can resuscitate. Uh, the difficulty in using something like a live dead stain is really all it interrogates is the uh, impactments of the membrane, whether the membranes are um, permeabilized or not, whether the stain is entering or not. So we, we have used this what's called live dead stain technique, which a lot of people in the room are familiar with, but uh, the impression is that there are a significant number of cells that are, quote, dead, but it really just means the same thing as uh, what we see in the electron microscope uh, images, that the membranes are permeabilized. So we haven't really performed uh, those studies to see, to, to understand, you know, what's the viability? Can they continue to grow during that time? Yes? Breaking down cadmium and the stain. So during the course during the course of the experiment, could there be selection for um, within that population, selection for um, types, uh, for strains that, for groups that are more resistant to cadmium than others, for individuals? Absolutely, that could absolutely happen. I mean, this is something that we have to deal with for microbiology. We're always working with populations. Do my microbiology colleagues agree with me about this? Yeah, we're always working with populations. And so, you know, there's always the possibility that during this time course, so, so we look at the doubling time, and if it's a couple of hours, if it's four hours, and over the course of uh, lag phase, if it's six hours, yeah, it's entirely possible that the stain actually cures some subpopulations that have different characteristics than they might have. Yes, and so the increase, in it, it, it is an indication, um, and also it's, it, can, you know, it can be difficult to show exactly what the origin of the lag phase is, right? So, um, especially with optical materials. Yes, Marilyn. Are they, do, do you see, you, I mean, you see, of course, a longer time frame until they're actually bro broken down? Do you, or have you looked at the cells? That's a good question. Uh, we haven't been in my group and in the context of this collaboration, I appreciate all uh, membership in that paper. We haven't been working with other quantum dots. And uh, you uh, raise a key issue, which is if you vary the chemistry, if we vary the size, if we cap the quantum dot with some other sort of ribbon, if we core, if we if we um, cover them with zinc sulfide, or some other sort of coating that will enhance their fluorescence, and so that's often done to enhance their fluorescence. These aren't particularly bright. Um, then it could entirely change the toxicity, and, and and that was one of the results from the Chang et al. paper that I shared with you, where they when they targeted the quantum dot, changed their degree of amyl sulfosis and 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 changed. So um, what have others reported? Um, our collaborator, Joe Nadeau, has uh, studied many different uh, chemistries of quantum dots, capping chemistries, and has seen you know, profound effects on uh, what's on the outside of the quantum dot in terms of whether or not you could change the cells, and has also designed particular ligands that will be attracted to particular receptors on the cell and, 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 and enable quantum dots to likelihood of uptake in cells. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, uh, there's an interest in designing materials 
so have a higher affinity for cells and higher likelihood of uptake as you can improve the staining uh, aspect. On the other hand, um, you know, we want to kind of understand how the different surface chemistries Could be more toxic in marine ecosystem than in terrestrial ecosystems. What 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 would you what is the basis? What do you think? What is the basis for your Just question? because, like in marine ecosystems, um, the reaction is the the chemical reaction is maybe totally different just because it's in liquid and the oxidation level yeah. is different. And in soil, you have all the associations with salt particles, so could be quite different. And so in sediments, in even in marine systems, whether it's in sediments or in the water column, yeah. or maybe these would have an affinity to cadmium, the ions that are released or the quantum dots have a high affinity for marine snow, for floss that are in the uh, you know, water column, the peak roof. All important questions. Where do they, uh, where are they transferred or created? But do you have a guess? <laughs> in the marine environment? Um, well, you know, I guess my, an expectation would be given that the, the cationic nature of the cadmium is that it will tend to hyperaccumulate inside um, anionic polymers that are associated with uh, microbial biofilms and with other uh, organisms. And the quantum dots, uh, well, we have a guess from possibly another study that we've been doing where we looked at uh, biomagnification. If they end up in the bacteria, the predators are the next tier of, of, of um, effect on um, accumulation. And we believe we have evidence for biomagnification as a source of that. Just one step closer. Thank you.